Well, welcome everybody. I think we have a little bit of a smaller group today, so hopefully we can get a little bit more engagement from our group. Um, my name is Daniel Steger. I'm the technical community manager here at the Center for Open Science. Uh, my job is to work with researchers figure out how you use the OSF, but also to work on things like this, where we can give some onboarding information into how to actually use our platform. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm joined here today by the rest of the product team. Um, we have some experts and who's actually building the OSF and really experts in open science. So if you have any questions or you would like to know more, or I'm going too quickly, uh, make sure to ask in the chat. Uh, they're there to help you and answer some of your questions as we go along. As I said, I'm going to try and keep this to less than an hour, so we'll have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Uh, but with that being said, uh, sometimes there's just a lot to talk about. So make sure you do ask your questions in the chat. We are pretty responsive in answering those. All right. So with that being said, our marketing friend here is going to add a poll for everybody. Uh, this is a great way for us to just get started. I want to know how familiar you are with the OSF. Uh, so if you have an OSF account, that's really great to know. Um, how familiar are you? Um, are you just getting started? Are you just learning? Um, especially with these OSF 101 webinars, I can kind of shift the information back and forth a little bit, go into more detail in different sections, just based on how the polls are coming in. So we have a good amount of people who are not really familiar with the OSF. That's fantastic. That means that we have a lot to dive into and a lot of things that you can learn today. But we also have a lot of people who have accounts. That's great. Uh, and we're going to be able to make our way through that as well. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the webinar format. Uh, so today is going to be a webinar where we're going to talk about the intro to the OSF uh, and really some open science practices in general. Uh, this is meant to be a hands-on webinar, so a lot of the things I'm going to be doing are going to be kind of demos that you can try on your own time. Uh, one of the things that we have here is if you are curious about some of the links that I'm talking about, or maybe I post them in the chat and you lose them, uh, this is a great way of keeping on track with what's going on. Uh, it has a great table of contents where we're going to be covering a lot of the information that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, feel free to go through and follow along with those links. Uh, but if you do have any questions, again, just make sure that you are posting into the chat. Another thing that I want to make note of as well is that uh, when we do these, uh, these OSF 101 webinars, we kind of shift around the ratio a little bit of what we're talking about because in reality, we do have a lot of overlap of people who do come back to these webinars and learn more and more. Uh, so what we do is sometimes we gloss over certain parts that we've talked about in the past in order to create new content for something that people can look into. So if I do go a little too quickly in a section, one of the things I want you to check out is we do have a recording library where we do dive into some of these different things that we're going to talk about um, in more detail. And they're kind of broken up into shorter clips that you can really break into uh, and understand what those different sections are. So be sure to check that out and I'll reference that a little bit more as we go along. All right, again, uh, follow along in that document, uh, but we do have the product team here for some Q&A support. Make sure that you are asking those questions in the chat. They are very, very helpful to us. So where do we start? What is the OSF? Uh, so the OSF is a free, open source, uh, online research platform. Uh, it is a platform that is designed to help support researchers share their work openly and transparently throughout the entire research lifecycle. So not just focusing on one section, one tool, we're trying to create a space where you can connect all of your research into a really, almost like a chapter book where you have created different sections of what you're trying to do, and then a researcher can come in and look at the entire story of what your research is about. And we're hoping that you can share that openly and transparently so that researchers can follow along with what happened, whether that's good or bad. Um, it helps people build upon what you were trying to do. So with that being said, uh, we're gonna start off here with your account and profile. Now, some of you I see do not have an OSF account. Uh, the first thing that you would do is go to our OSF.io. I'm on our test site, um, but all you would do is go to OSF.io. 
Uh, first thing you're going to do is go up to this top right hand corner up here where it says uh, sign in or sign up. If you have not created an account, all you do is click sign up. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. The first one is you would fill out your full name, uh, your email address, confirm the email address and create a password. That's pretty much the most straightforward way of creating a work. Um, again, I am away from home. So if my internet comes in and out, I fully apologize. Uh, but there's other ways that you can also do this as well. Uh, one of those ways is to use your ORCID profile, which is a persistent identifier uh, for researchers. We'll talk a little bit more about what those are in a bit. Or you can sign in through your institution. Now, it's important to note uh, that your institution does not necessarily mean that it's all institutions in the world. Uh, institutions are a fee-for-service product that we offer on the OSF, where universities and different, obviously, institutions uh, can work with us to try and aggregate all of their work from their researchers on the OSF. Uh, if that's something that you'd be interested in, make sure to message into the chat. Our team will be able to put you in the direction of the right people. But as part of that, you're able to use uh, your single sign-in method so a lot of researchers and institutions have their own sign-in method, their own sign-in platform. Uh, we would be able to connect you to that. So researchers can just sign in through how they would normally sign in to their institution. If you have any questions on if your institution is in our institution database, uh, make sure to uh, message into the chat. Uh, we have a whole link of who could, um, of our existing institution members. Now, again, I'm gonna actually switch to sign in as I already have an OSF account. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is again, go to that top right-hand corner and click sign in. Again, there are three different ways of signing in. Uh, signing in through your ORCID profile, signing in through your institution, or just an email and password. Uh, I'm going to sign in through my email and password, which is just things I plug in here. Uh, now, we do highly suggest that you set up a two-factor system that basically just sends a redirect, um, a secondary level of permissions uh, where it'll send a code to your phone, or you can use some sort of auth um, security platform um, like Google authorization, uh, where you can put in a timed code that'll also help you log in. Uh, now, now that I have logged into the OSF, uh, I'm going to show you your, uh, your OSF profile. Um, to do that, you're going to go up here into the top right hand corner, click this drop down arrow, uh, and you will see the My Profile section. I'm going to click on that, and this will take you to your OSF profile. Uh, now, this is a page that is going to see a little bit of a revamp, hopefully within the next year, uh, where you're able to show a little bit more of your public facing work. Uh, and you're able, going to be able to share that out a little bit easier uh, with your audience or whoever is going to be looking at it. But for right now, uh, you'll see the main basic sections where you have your name. Uh, you'll have a unique URL that's specific to your profile. Uh, so say this URL is just specific to me as this uh, researcher. All of our public projects and public components will be shared here. Uh, nothing that's private is gonna be displayed on your public profile. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what projects and components are in a bit, uh, but for right now, this is just uh, all things that are basically public will be shown up here. Now, another section I wanna talk about super quickly is your edit your profile section. Uh, you'll see here that you're able to add some information. So say some of your social information, like your uh, LinkedIn, your uh, Twitter or X profiles, anything that you really want to share, you're able to share that here. You're able to put some uh, employer information, uh, some of your education information, if that's something that you choose to share with your audience. Uh, to do some of these things, you're going to go up here to, again, the top right-hand corner here, where you'll see Edit Your Profile. I'm going to click on that. And in order to do some of these things, you're going to click on the different tabs where you can add things to your website, Research ID, LinkedIn, Google Scholar profile, anything that can really link you as a researcher uh, really can connect back to your profile. We'll talk a little bit more about why that's important and creating as many connections as you can uh, later on. But for right now, uh, just note that this is a way that you can actually do that. And what you would do is you'd enter that information and click save at the bottom, that green button. 
Another thing that I want to point out is you can actually add some things. So if you have multiple email addresses associated with your account, uh, you can add email addresses. So I have two email addresses uh, and I can switch what is the primary email address. That basically means which one am I logging into the OSF through. Uh, right now I log in through my COS email address, but I could, if I wanted to, make this VT email address my, uh, my primary email address. I could change the storage location. Um, so this is the default storage of where all of my work is on the OSF is going to be stored. Uh, there's a couple of different locations for that. Uh, Germany, Frankfurt, um, Canada, if I wanted to do that. Uh, a lot of reasons why we do that is it helps you get around uh, some storage restrictions. So especially like the EU, uh, you're going to want to be storing in somewhere in Europe. Uh, additionally, if you want to opt out of some email sharing uh, notifications, this is a great way of doing that. Uh, that two-factor identification uh, is another great one that I highly suggest. If you're looking to change your password, this is another way of doing it. Uh, if you want to request deactivating your account, you can do that at the bottom. Okay, go back here and go to our next section. So discovering content on the OSF. Uh, Recently, within the last year, we actually went through the process of revamping how our search works on the OSF. Now, I'm going to go to the regular OSF and not our test site for this. Um, and the way that you would do this is if you want to search for content on the OSF, uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go up here to the top search bar and you're going to find uh, the word search. Now, it's going to take you to our new search page. Now, there's two different perspectives I want you to take on this. The first one that I'm going to walk you through is I want you to think about this from your perspective. You're a researcher. You want to learn more about whatever field or whatever uh, new project that you have going on. You want to learn more about what's out there. Uh, the second perspective is you're going to try and flip it and think about it from an outside person's perspective. You want to be creating your projects, your information on the OSF in a way that's easy for others to find your work. Um, so for this first one, when you're looking at it from your perspective, trying to find something, uh, you have a couple of different tools that are at your disposal. Uh, obviously, the most easy one is your search bar. You can search via terms and things that you can look at. Uh, a section that I want to point out here is this bar that's right along here. Uh, it's towards the middle, uh, but you could search through all of the things that are on the OSF. Or if you want to break it down by tool, you only want to search for projects, which is a tool in the OSF we'll talk about. Uh, if you only want to look for registrations or pre-registrations, if you only want to look for preprints, if you only want to look for files, you can do that by basically isolating those different sections. Another thing I want to point out is you can also break it down by a lot of these different fields. Uh, these fields are called metadata. Uh, metadata is essentially data about your project. Um, Again, we're kind of flipping that script again uh, and thinking about it from how would others find your work. So these researchers who posted all this information into the OSF, uh, they were able to say, hey, my work on the OSF is actually considered a data set. This file that I'm working on is actually considered an image. Um, as you can see from the you know, these 10,000 results, I can now isolate specific things. So if I only want to look for images, I can do that. And that drastically narrows down the number of like items that I would be searching through. You're basically creating a smaller field for people to find your work. So it's something that would give you a distinct advantage, especially if you're trying to find, um, if you want researchers to find your work for those citations. Other areas, uh, that you can try and search through is say you want to isolate by funder. Uh, we have different funders that you could connect with your OSF project. So say your work is funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, you can actually connect that to your registration, to your projects, to your files, and we'll show you how to do that later. Um, but this, all of this is the ability for you as a researcher to one, find what you're trying to find on the OSF, but then two, help others find your work as well. So say I add some criteria here. The last thing I want to show you is if I wanted to say, look for only preprints that are 
created in 2024, and they are under the subject line of social and science behavior. I can now take that, and every time I was clicking on one of those buttons, I have created a unique URL. So say I wanted to share this list of 7,504 results with my rest of my audience here. I could take that information, click on that URL, copy it, and I could post it right here into the chat. So now anyone here can click on that link and see the exact page that I'm on. It's really handy for sharing your work. All right, so let's move on quickly. Go to the next section. You are in the planning stage of your research. Let's talk about registrations and pre-registrations. Registrations and pre-registrations are essentially a way of calling your shot. They're a way of saying, hey, here is my research protocol and I'm establishing that prior to actually finishing the rest of my project. Um, there's a very specific way of doing that. And the reason why we do that is because it allows researchers to show kind of transparency. You're able to create a plan, lock it in stone with a time stamp saying at this moment in time, this is what my registration looked like. This is what my pre-registration looked like. And then when you get all the way through that process, you've conducted the experiment, you've collected, you've analyzed, and now you're ready to publish, you can publish and release at the same time and say, hey, here are my results, all the things that I came up with. This matches what my plan was here. Uh, the reason why we do this is for those who may not be the most ethical of researchers, uh, we try. Uh, we tend to use this analogy of uh, firing an arrow. And if you were an unethical researcher, you could technically fire an arrow without a registration, could land, and you could draw a target right around where it landed. And they say, yep, yeah, I totally meant to do that. You could go back in hindsight and change your experiment so that it could look like it matches. It's not best practice, obviously, and it hurts science in general, but that's kind of where registrations and pre-registrations started. Now, the terminology of registrations and pre-registrations, um, again, uh, you can think about this as a study management plan or story uh, of your research project. Now, they've grown and evolved since then. I'll kind of show how that's happened um, and what pre-registration could end up looking like and how you could connect more things. But one of the things I want to point out is the difference between registrations and pre-registrations. It really comes down to time. Um, oversimplifying, it really comes down to timing. Uh, a pre-registration, typically you want to submit that form prior to conducting your experiment, prior to actually starting your experiment, you're creating that plan. Whereas a registration, you could technically submit that form um, after you've started conducting, reporting, and publishing. Um, you could see how that would be a little bit more of a gray area. That's why we tend to uh, suggest that people uh, do that pre-registration rather than the registration phase. But uh, registering your work if you've already conducted and started that experiment is still better than not doing anything at all. Now, big question that usually comes up at this point, I am a little afraid of sharing my work, uh, sharing my plan for my study because in my field, you know, scooping, having my work stolen is a very common experience. Uh, what we do, because obviously in you know, this idealistic notion of science, it'd be fantastic if everybody was able to share their idea, get credit for it, and you know, stealing, scooping never happened. Uh, but we do live in the real world, so we offer some tools in order to get around that. What you can do is if you are going to be submitting your pre-registration, uh, you will be going through a process that you can embargo. Uh, embargoing is temporarily making your registration private or pre-registration private uh, for up to four years. So if today you have a plan that you're trying to put out and you're going to be conducting this experiment, you can submit your registration, submit your plan, your pre-registration, uh, and you can embargo your work for up to four years. That gives you four years of your work being private and it, it gives you four years of your work being private in order to avoid that you know, scooping process. And what will happen is after you've published, you've submitted, it's accepted, it's released, you can then go through 
and release your uh, pre-registration. All you're doing there is saying, hey, this is what my results were and that's what my plan was. It adds a lot of validity and honestly gravitas to your research experiment. Uh, and it's something that now research um, publishers and different grants uh, works are, are starting to require because again, it is allowing people to make sure that the plan matches up with what the results ended up being, whether that is good or bad. So what does a embargoed registration look like? So if you have, you know, a blocked registration that is embargoed, that'll look something like this. I'm going to share this here. Essentially, if someone happens upon your URL, uh, you would be up here and it would be something that looks like this page not found. Uh, they really would have no idea what this is. Uh, but the point is, is that this keeps your information 100% private until you are able to release it four years or even sooner, as soon as your experiment is done. Uh, but if, say, you wanted to share that work, that embargoed registration with somebody, uh, you can actually create what are called view-only links. Uh, view-only links are a great way of sharing your registration plan or so on with a grant funder, a colleague, someone that's trusted that you want to share that with. Uh, this is the exact same registration, just the public view from everybody else, and this view-only link that I created. Uh, if you have questions about how to create the only links, uh, we do have some help guides that can help you out with that process. Uh, but this is what that registration ended up looking like. So now let's take a look at what the process is for creating a, uh, a uh, registration. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be creating a new registration. I'm going to go to this top section here where it says home. I'm going to click registries which will take me to our registries section of the OSF. I'm gonna go up here to this top section where it says, uh, this top bar where it says add new. Now, at this point, I have a couple of different questions. Uh, the first one is, do I want to base my registration on an OSF project? Uh, this is one way of connecting an OSF project to a registration. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Uh, but right now, I do not have anything I want to connect it with. Uh, I also have different uh, types of registrations that I can, uh, different templates, different things uh, of ways of framing our registration process. Uh, now, if you do see that your community typically has a specific version of uh, a registration template, uh, we actually have a working group where we evaluate those types of templates, those community developed templates. And we can add those into the OSF. All you do is submit uh, an application. Uh, so uh, those templates, uh, if you have questions about selecting what registration template you would like, I'm going to add that to the chat here as well. This is just a help guide that'll help you select what registration template you would like. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to go with one of our basic OSF pre-registration templates. Mm -hmm. Uh, the beautiful thing about this particular template is it starts to ask you questions. Uh, it asks you questions that frame both the metadata and all the information that would kind of help you think through what an experiment would look like. Um, as you can see, I have sections like title, description, uh, licenses, subjects. All these things are broken down into uh, in some of our help guides. Uh, but it does help you kind of think through uh, what your hypothesis would be, how you're going to be designing your study, uh, sampling plans, variables, all those things that you really would want to explain, uh, especially as at the end you would have your results. How would you want to make sure that those things match? Uh, at the end of this process, uh, if I were to go through and fill this out, I would have to click register and a pop-up window would show up before it actually either becomes public or embargoed, but it could ask you whether you want to embargo that registration or not. Uh, this is one of the ones that we have gone into a little bit more detail on. Uh, so if you do have questions, please make sure that you go through and look at our uh, videos uh, on our our training videos from previous OSF 101 webinars. All right. So another section, study management tools and collaborations, OSF projects. Now, OSF projects are a really great tool in that they're flexible. 
there are a very flexible workspace for you to kind of work through. Um, also, projects can be used essentially at any stage of the research lifecycle, whether you're planning, conducting, reporting, or even discovering some work. OSF projects can help you do that. Uh, the idea being that a way of thinking about OSF projects is if you combined your current folder structure for your research projects, uh, how you would lay out that top level of folder and then all the subfolders that you have kind of laying around on your desktop. This is a great way of kind of mimicking that, but then also adding in layers of research tools, collaboration tools that could help you both frame your store, your data, your work, your research notes, whatever that may be, but framing it in an organized way for others to come in and help collaborate and see things in real time. Uh, now, uh, one of those things, and one of the things that I kind of glossed over when we were talking about the profile page, is the difference between projects and components. Uh, those subsections, uh, those folders, those things that we're talking about, you can really build out those as components. So your project is your main top level project, uh, whereas any component are going to be like subfolders within that main project. Uh, for example, a very simple rudimentary way of looking at it is that your top project up here is a research, your research lab. That's the top level. Um, but then within that, you could have sub project or a component for your first research initiative, your second research initiative, uh, whatever you have going on in your lab. And then within that, you can even break it down even more components. Uh, you could have a project or a component for hypotheses, data collection, protocols, lab notebooks, anything that would be associated with that first research initiative. Um, the beautiful thing about that is that you would be able to kind of look at each one of those levels and make sure that you are sharing whatever information you want with particular people. Another very valuable thing about this is that on each one of those levels, you can control the permissions. Uh, so say I wanted for my research initiative one to have the data collection and lab notebooks public, but I wanted to hide that hypothesis and that protocol. Uh, projects are flexible and the components within them are flexible. So you could have sections that are public and sections that are private, and you could switch those at any time. So what does a project look like on the OSF? Uh, so if I were going to go and create a OSF project, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go to even just a regular dashboard. Uh, this is when you click osf.io. It'll take you right to the main page. And you'll see a section here that says create a new project. Um, I'm going to click this green button and it'll take me to a pop-up window. Um, here I am able to add a title or I'll just add test. I'm able to add any associated OSF uh, institutions or affiliations that I have. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to click the COS affiliation. Uh, I can select where I want this data to be stored. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go with the United States and I'm going to click create. I'm going to go to where that project is here, clicking that green button. Now, when you come to an OSF project, it is a little bit intimidating where you have you know, a very blank page if you're creating it this way. Um, so looking at some of these different sections, uh, one of the main things I want to point out is again, each one of those things can be made public or private at any time. And you can switch back and forth, which is very important. I have a file storage area. Uh, another thing that's important to note is that for each OSF project and every component within it, uh, you have a five gigabyte, if it's private, storage limit. But if it's public, you have a 50 gigabyte storage limit. Again, we are trying to encourage people to be more open and public with their work, hence the larger storage limit. But for each component that you create, you can have an additional five gigabyte, 50 gigabyte storage limit within that component. So that talks a little bit about the components. And if I want to create a component, uh, it's very simple. All you do is click the add component button and it'll take you through a very similar process as creating a project. I'm going to have a title. I'm going to choose where that storage location is. Uh, and I can even add the same contributors, the people who are part of the project on that byline uh, on this project. Or I can even add some of the tags and other associated things with that. Here, I can add what license we want to use. Uh, if you have questions about choosing what license, we have help guides on that. Uh, licenses are essentially 
making sure that you are describing how you would like your research to be shared with others. Uh, adding descriptions, categories, all these things are important, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about why. Uh, the wiki is a very flexible workspace where it's essentially a whiteboard. It's a way for you to communicate with whoever is seeing your work. So I've seen researchers who will use this. They're running a lab. Uh, they can run their ordering schedule through this. So if they're running a classroom, they can put their syllabus on there. Uh, if you're running an experiment, you could put the timeline for when you want your experiments to be done or even a message board back and forth. Uh, there's really no shortage of ways that you can use a wiki. Again, a citation line uh, is really helpful, especially if you're looking for uh, ways for external people to cite your work. Um, and any contributor that is on here will have a specific area of that citation. Uh, if you want to add a contributor, uh, you're going to go up here to the contributors line right next to your name. Click contributors and you're going to search them by clicking this add contributors button searching by their name or that profile information. Um, that'll help you add whoever you want. So in this case, I'm going to add a colleague who helps me a lot. I'm going to click Add, which is that green button here. And looking at this, you'll have a couple different options. If I do not want them to be on that byline, so say they're a lab manager, they're helping out, but they're not part of that publication line, uh, I can remove them by clicking this bibliographic contributor button. Uh, and I would take a second and look at our permissions. Um, again, this is a link I'm going to post here to you guys. Uh, if you have questions about what the permission level and what that does for a project, uh, make sure to read it. There's three levels, admin, read and write, or if they're just a read only access. I'm going to click X and get back to our main project. Uh, recent activity is a very important thing or it helps you see exactly what has happened on that project and really only admin are able to see that. Um, so this is not the same as say a registration where every update is noted, um, but it is also important to make sure that you note um, some of these recent activities that could happen. Additionally, um, I'm gonna go quickly back to registrations and I fully apologize for this. Um, where I'm going to look at some of the registrations that I have submitted. Uh, if I wanted to update my registration, and again, I apologize because I am going back and forth here a little bit. Um, if you wanted to update a registration, I'm able to do that by going up here and clicking update. Um, I am able to submit a new update, but I do have to be an admin on this particular one. Fully apologize for this one. Update and projects. Okay. So this is a registration that I had submitted a little while ago. It's obviously a test on our test site, but I can continue or start an update by clicking updates and continue an update. Uh, all this does is it allows you to make some minor changes uh, to that template of your registration. Um, and by doing that, you're able to create a secondary snapshot. Uh, by doing that, you could see both the original version of your registration and a secondary version of your registration. Now, I know that was confusing because I bounced back and forth between registrations and projects, and I fully apologize again for that. But if you do have any questions on projects, please do let our team know, uh, ask questions into the chat, and we'll be able to help you out. I'll talk about some of these other things as well. Um, on a project, you're able to see some analytics, which are basically the views of how many people are looking at your, uh, your project, especially if it's public. Uh, you're able to connect some registrations, talk about contributors, and uh, again, add-ons. Uh, so add-ons are a way of connecting some of the existing tools that you use on the OSF with your projects. Uh, you can connect things like uh, Google Drive, GitLab, um, and this is something that we've dove into a little bit more with some of those other uh, training videos. So I take a second and look at those as well. Okay. Uh, again, those components are gonna be associated with these different sub-levels of projects. Uh, sharing your research. Uh, so if you are say on the OSF and you want to share your work, you can do, th do so through our preprint service. Uh, how I would do that is I would go to the preprint section. And again, that's clicking OSF home clicking the down arrow, and then clicking preprints. Uh, yes, uh, recordings are going to be shared uh, right after this uh, meeting. Now, 
Uh, to submit a preprint, we've created actually a couple of different workflows. Uh, each preprint service has its own page, uh, but the most direct way of doing this is to go up to that top bar again and click the Add Preprint button. This will actually take you to all of our preprint services. Uh, we have a bunch of different partners, uh, groups that have run their uh, preprint service that are more subject-based or area-based. Uh, on through the OSF and you can select which one you would like to submit to. Now, each one has their own moderation rules, which is you know, how they evaluate uh, works coming in. So it's important to research a little bit before you get that started. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to select the OSF framework. And I'm going to, to go down here to click create preprint. Now, again, I'm on our test site, so I can just add some information here. But I can look at tests. I can add an abstract to the project and just click through. I can upload a file from our computer, uh, my computer. Um, what I can do is just move this over. Uh, and then again, the same process goes for uh, as I'm going through this, I'm just adding a file from my desktop and hopefully that loads. Yep, there you go. Click next. Uh, metadata is a very important thing where it helps you find what is being searched for. Uh, I'm going to click some information here, licenses, choosing. But again, it's a very similar process to that registration where you are selecting information to help researchers uh, evaluate whether they want to use your work or not. Um, uh, talking about author assertions, conflict of interest. Again, these are things that we dove into a little bit more with some of these other projects. Uh, and connecting an OSF project. We'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Um, but again, I'm going to review all this information and it's going to go to a preprint service. Now, uh, the OSF itself is a moderated service now. Uh, we do have a very low moderation bar, uh, but the content does have to be specific to research. Now, if you do have questions on that, we do have help guides that can help you evaluate whether your work would be applicable or not. Okay. Time to get into a little bit of a new section for those who have not been here before uh, or who have been here before, but maybe looking at a little bit of new content. Uh, so let's talk about relationships, connecting your resources across the entire OSF. Okay, taking a step back. If you've gone through the process so far, you've created a project, you've created your OSF profile, uh, you have created a registration, you've created a preprint. You have these tools. Uh, and the metaphor I'd used at the beginning was you've created chapters in a book. Now it's time to put the binding together. How are they gonna fit together? Switching between metaphors, uh, it's not only a book that you've created, you want researchers to come and read that book. Uh, and thinking about all the researchers in the world, you want to be collecting and casting a net in a very specific section so that you catch the researchers who are going to actually want to use your work, right? So the first thing I want you to think about is this idea of persistent identifiers. Uh, you're going to be connecting those chapters of your book, that preprint, the registrations, the projects. You're going to be connecting all of that information together uh, with what are called persistent identifiers. Now, a persistent identifier is essentially a link. Uh, it is an externally maintained link. Um, so like an ORCID ID, a DOI. Uh, but these links are externally maintained so that they never break. Um, I'd be curious to see, and you can feel free to put this in the chat if you've ever had this happen to you. Have you ever been on, you know, reading a research paper, a publication, and it says, hey, here's a link to my data and all the things that are associated with it, or uh, a link to a project or something that's you know, associated with this, you know, publication. You're really interested in that. You click on it and it ends up being a broken link. That broken link is kind of like a hole in this net of trying to catch these researchers coming into your work, right? Uh, so instead of all of these things on our OSF profiles being connected together, I now have a hole where that preprint might be. Uh, that means that there's a gap of somebody who might come to my preprint and they might not be able to find everything else. That's really unfortunate. Um, so one of the ways we get around that is again called persistent identifiers. Uh, those are externally maintained links. Uh, we use DataCite and Crossref uh, to help maintain uh, each one of those links. And I'll show you what that looks like on each one of these projects. Uh, but say 
uh, if you're trying to connect your preprint, your registration, your profile, all those things would be maintained through persistent identifiers. So let's take a quick look at how can I connect all these different parts of my projects and registrations and components together. Uh, so the first one I want to look at is, say, uh, this project that we created. Um, so I'm going to go back to our test site. I'm going to go to my projects. I'm going to look at the first project that I created, which was the one that we just did 12 minutes ago. There's a couple of different things. So the first thing is that now that I'm on my project, I don't see a DOI. Do you? That's because DOIs are really meant for things that are public. So anything that you find on the OSF, whether it's a registration or you know, a project or a preprint, they really have to be public in order to get that DOI, that digital object identifier, which is our links to different things. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is, in this case, I'm going to make this project public. Once I click and make that public, you'll see over in this uh, left-hand column, a section called Create a DOI. This allows me to create a DOI, which as you guys will see, is a digital object identifier. This is a link that I'm able to use and connect in different ways. Okay, another question. I wanna connect this project to a registration. I've created and filled out this form and there's a couple of different uh, ways of doing that. Uh, one other thing, that you might want to do is I would look up, we have a way of looking at templates of this project. If you want to fill out that information, that's another one, a link that we can send in the chat here. But uh, say I want to connect my project to a registration. Up here in the top bar, I'm going to click registrations. And I want to create a registration based on that project. I filled this out and I filled out all the information my uh, registration in that project. I could create a registration based on that project. All I would do is create a new registration after clicking that top bar. And this allows me to create, again, that same registration workflow, but this one is based on my project. So say I wanted to go through that process and I'm gonna go through a standard pre-registration template. Uh, let's go over right here. I'm gonna create a draft. This will pull in information from my project. Now, obviously I didn't fill that out very much, but as you can see, the title of it is the same as what my project was, test. It'll have the same contributors, but make sure that you do test and check what permission levels you want to have on your registration versus your project, because those can be different. But that's a great way of connecting a project from a registration. Now, let's also talk about registrations. How can you connect a registration to both your projects and your preprints? Well, first, let's take that DOI that we had here uh, and I'm going to go back. Oops. Right here. Uh, we're going to go back to the overview of this project. I'm going to take that DOI and I'm going to go to, say, this registration that is mine. This is one that we had kind of worked through and we've shown. Now, if, say, I wanted to connect a registration, now this is, again, a public registration. Down here, you'll see where that registration DOI is located. Again, only public registrations have that DOI, uh, but sometimes we'll get questions in, say, support that'll ask us, hey, where's my registration number, my registration ID? You're looking for that registration DOI that's located right here. A couple of different things that you can do. Once you have, uh, say, filled out this test information, you've created components, you've created all these different things, uh, your data analyses, all these you know, things that are associated with the project. You can take these different DOIs and each component can have its own DOI. And you can go up here to what are called open resources practice badges. Along this left-hand column, you'll see resources. I'm gonna click this. And all this is, is I'm able to choose what resource type I'm gonna be adding and connecting to my registration. The idea is that now that you've created you know, a registration, which is a plan, I can now connect all the things that are associated that came after that plan, whether that's the data analysis or analytic code, the materials, the papers, uh, all those things can be supplemental to my work. Now, in this case, I will say that that project is data. I want to add that DOI from our OSF project, and I can add a description if I want. I could connect it 
So now anyone who finds my registration will then see that there is data associated with that registration. Additionally, if I'm on a preprint and I have you know, went through the whole preprint process and I have a DOI that's associated with it. I can take that DOI, copy it and bring it back to that registration and add it as another papers that are associated with that. Uh, additionally, you can do this with your peer reviewed publicated version of your, um, your, your publication. Uh, you could take that DOI that they give you and add it back to your registration. All that you're trying to do is make sure that you are creating as many connections as possible. Uh, the last one I want to point out is if you're on a preprint, you're able to actually make some of those connections as well. Uh, if you want to, and we kind of glossed over this, uh, edit your preprint, go all the way down to uh, next, 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 next supplements. I can connect an existing uh, OSF project, or I can also connect a uh, new OSF project, or I can create a new OSF project as well. Again, you're creating those linkages that can go together. Now, going back to our presentation here, we've talked about where those locations are for each one of those things. Uh, you talked about how you can associate your projects with your registrations, your preprints, and kind of make sure that you're connecting all those things together. Let's take it another step back. Uh, because we have partnerships with DataSite and with ORCID, uh, you are actually able to connect all of your work on the OSF with your ORCID profile, which is a persistent identifier for you as a researcher. Uh, how that looks is that say, all of your work on the OSF, you have a bunch of different projects that you have on the OSF. You can connect all of those automatically with your uh, ORCID profile. Uh, the way that you do this is a little bit more complicated. So the first thing you're going to do is actually go to ORCID. Uh, for anyone who's looking that up, that's ORCID.org. Uh, uh, ORCID uh, first thing you're going to do is either sign in or register. Uh, and then I'm going to actually sign in to ORCID. And if you are wondering, man, he's going really quick through this. Uh, what you can do is you can look at this help guide that we have. Uh, one second. As a way of connecting your work. Uh, this will walk you through this exact same process. Uh, but what you would do is once you've logged into ORCID, I would go down to the bottom where it says works. I'm going to click this add button and I'm going to click search and link. All this is going to do is show us all the ways that I can connect my ORCID profile with something. In this case, you're going to connect it with data site. That should be like the fifth one down. I'm going to click data site. It's going to go through an authorization method, and I'm going to authorize this access. Again, the reason why I'm doing this is that we have a partnership with data site. And if you add any DOI or create a project or preprint or a registration, you're actually creating that connection with data site. And by connecting this you know, connection with ORCID with data site, you can actually connect your OSF profiles. Anything you create on the OSF can go directly to your ORCID profile, which are used for a lot of different uh, grant applications, things like that. So I'm going to click update here, click save. Auto save is now enabled. So now if I go to my OSF project, uh, this is again on our test site, uh, but all uh, the last step that I would need to do is go to my profile page, which is right here, top left or right hand corner, click my profile, I'm going to leave. The last thing I'm going to need to do is make sure that my profile on the OSF is connected with that ORCID account. I'm going to click edit your profile. I'm going to go to social and I'm going to add my ORCID number. Uh, for those who aren't sure what your ORCID number is, once you have created and registered on ORCID ID, I take that information and I'm going to set this up here. And I'm going to click save. By doing this, I have connected my profile with that ORCID account. And now anything I create on the OSF will now automatically sync with my ORCID profile, which is very valuable, uh, especially for saving time. So now that we've cast our net a little bit wider, connected all of our projects with our ORCID profile, you can see how our net's getting a little bit wider and wider and wider, where 
a researcher who, say, finds a preprint on this project could then find our profile, our projects, but then also find our profile ID through ORCID and then connect to all the other things that we are doing. Lastly, I want to talk about metadata. We talked a little bit about this when we were talking about search, but there's another perspective when you're looking through things on the OSF. You want to make sure that researchers are able to find your work on the OSF. So if you're looking at whether it's projects, the files on your projects, uh, the components, uh, your registrations, your registration files, your preprints, all of them can have what are called metadata. Metadata are just ways of finding your work. It's data about your data. Um, the idea being that if, say, someone is on just a regular OSF and I go to search, any of the information that I find on here, all this layered information, the title, the authors, where is it from, the date created, date modified, all those badges, those things that we were talking about, they're all considered metadata because at this very high level, for an outside researcher, I'm selecting what paper or file or thing that I actually want to pay attention to. The more information that you provide, the stronger that net is, the better chance of people finding and clicking on your work. So here you can see a registration. I could see that this particular registration does not have any data associated with it, doesn't have any code, any materials, any paper, any supplements. But if, say, it did, it would make it much more appealing for me to actually click on this particular one. So what does that look like on each one of these sections? So say I go to uh, my registrations. This is a registration that I created on the OSF. I can edit the metadata by going over here on this left-hand column, clicking metadata. I can go through and make some changes. So that description, contributors, resource type, uh, funder languages. Remember, these are all the filters that people are trying to search for your work. Right now, I don't have anything associated with this one. So if someone were to say, even if this is a, you know, uh, a book, a chapter, a collection, they're not going to be able to find it unless I designate what it is, right? Uh, choosing what language it is, all these things are very important for others to find your work. So I would take Second, after you filled out all this information, make sure that you fill out the metadata. It's very important for people to find your work on the OSF. Same thing goes for when you're on a project. Uh, there's a metadata tab right up here at the top. If I click on that, I now have a very similar looking board. I have a description, contributors, what resources is it? Is it a uh, uh, you know, book, chapter, anything of that information? It helps people find your work. Make sure that you're filling that out. Additionally, any files that are associated with your work, and this particular one doesn't have a file, um, so I will actually just upload a file quickly. All I'm doing here is uploading a file from my computer. It's a test file that I use. Uh, but I can actually edit the metadata on this particular file as well. All I would do is right along this corner, you'll see metadata, click edit, this allows me to create fields for people to find uh, your work. Uh, lastly, on your preprint, uh, what you can do is go to uh, my projects. In this case, go to preprints, lying around a little bit. Uh, I'm going to find my preprint a little bit slower today. Click on the test. Now, for your metadata that is found here, you can either uh, look at it along the side here, or you can look at the top section. It'll be the third one down, edit metadata. This is the meta metadata field, but all these things along this field are again, ways of researchers finding your specific work. Again, that goal is to create as wide of a net as possible, but also make it as easy as possible for researchers to actually make sure that they end up in the right place. Now, I left all of four minutes for questions. I apologize. Hopefully our team was able to answer some of those questions in the chat here. Uh, but 
If you do have questions, uh, we offer, again, those video resources, things that I posted in the chat here and can again. Uh, we have our OSF Support Center, uh, which is both messages that you can send to our support team where you'll have experts like the rest of the product team to answer some of your questions. Uh, but we also have a plethora of help guides and ways that you can actually inform yourself as well, too. Uh, we offer monthly tips and tricks. Uh, this is emails that go out to all OSF users. So make sure that you check that out because we offer new and innovative ways of using the OSF uh, that we hear about and try and use. Uh, if you have questions, make sure you email support at osf.io. Um, again, we host these webinars every month. Next month, we actually have a excellent opportunity where we'll be going to take a deep dive into registrations and pre-registrations, learn a little bit more about that process and kind of dive into some case studies of how are people actually using registrations and pre-registrations on the OSF. Uh, if you have questions about organizational partnerships, I mentioned institutions, but we also have collections and uh, registries, all ways of kind of aggregating your work on a much larger uh, level. Make sure that you do do that. Uh, training. Uh, Crystal brings up an excellent point. She runs our training team. Uh, she and the rest of us would be happy to help you out if you're looking for uh, paying for a training for your specific group where we can actually dive in a little bit more uh, to what would be useful to you. Uh, don't be a stranger. Feel free to reach out and talk to us uh, about anything that's going on that you're having trouble with the OSF or uh, things you would like to work on. Um, with that, I do have a closing poll that I would really like people to answer because this is data that we use. Uh, at, if you learned something from the OSF uh, or from this getting started webinar, I'd love to know. Uh, if you have anything that you would like to learn more about, that's also really important. Uh, are you interested in participating in any activities, anything that goes on? Uh, those are also really important to know as well. Uh, we do look at these polls. That is the whole reason why we're doing that deep dive into registrations next month, is that we got this information from one of those polls. Uh, we listen to you and we're hoping to learn more. Uh, if you guys have any questions, again, post them in the chat. Uh, I'm going to take a quick scroll through and see if there's anything we can answer in the next minute or so. If not, uh, I do appreciate everyone's time for coming in and helping out. And hopefully you learned something a little bit more about the OSF. Um, please do. Uh, again, I mentioned this before. Don't be a stranger. Reach out if you have any questions. I do see some kind comments and I really appreciate those. Here's a question for you, Daniel. Yes. So we have one question that says that they are currently done with a scoping review protocol. The scoping okay. review is still in progress in two book chapters that are completed. How do you recommend they choose among being a new project, registration, or preprint? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would need to know a little bit more. Um, if they so they, they've created a scoping review protocol, which means they've created a registration to start. Uh, they kind of have two different options here. You can either create subsequent updates to your registration if it is based on that same experiment and you're kind of expanding upon it or you've made changes to what that original plan was or you can actually create a if you think it's a spin-off study a spin-off uh you know a different version uh, and warrants its own registration you can actually create that as well um those are things that you would really want to make sure that uh, are connected back to each other um, how did that sound, Mark? Uh, you, you tend to be a little bit more of the registration expert than I do. I agree with you. We need a little bit more details and kind of what you're imagining. So since we're at time, a follow-up question is we have several more questions that are in the chat that we just don't have time for, unfortunately. How can we connect and answer those questions? What should they expect? I'm sorry. I have my internet cut out one more time. 
So we have a few more questions in the chat that we just don't have time for because I think we're over time. Yeah. How can we connect with them to make sure yes. that they get the answer uh, they're seeking? If you do have questions, uh, make sure to email support at osf.io. Uh, send us an email with this question saying that you were in the webinar uh, and we'll get right back to you. Make sure that we're answering your questions. Um, and that's something that we, we, we want to stress. Uh, we want to hear your questions and we want to hear how we can improve as well. With that, I will probably start the process of closing us out. I do appreciate everyone for coming today. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, make sure to reach out to our team. All right. Thank you.